Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll be, we will be continuing our discussion of trust theory. In particular, we will be looking at uh, extending our single trust element uh, pinned end condition uh, assumption and applying that to an entire framework of elements. We'll, be uh, we'll also be exploring what pinned member uh, end conditions look like in uh, real structures uh, and comparing the engineering model to the real world structure. Finally, we'll be finishing up uh, by looking at some of the advantages and disadvantages of deterministic structures um, as trusses are, as well as uh, how to determine whether a truss is statically determinate or indeterminate. Again, the topic for today is going to be trusses and uh, let's review a little bit of uh, what well, we discussed last time when we looked at trusses, or at least the trust member condition, as a review, when you go and uh, put certain restrictions on the forces that an end, on the end forces that a member can support, or in other words, when you have a, any member, uh, any member with pins on both ends. and uh, no uh, loading other than at the ends. Well, that's what we refer to as the uh, trust member or the pin member condition. And if you recall from last time, uh, what is special about that is that uh, purely from just the principles of static equilibrium, what that produces is a condition where the member carries only a single axial force. So again, as a reminder, when you have a member with pins on both ends, that means it will only be able to carry either a single force, and this would be positive tension, for example, or you could have one that is the opposite, which would be in compression. Like this, which we, which for our sign convention, we will use as negative. So negative compression, negative compression, positive tension. And what I mean by a single force is that regardless of what, if I were to cut this beam, uh, or if I were to cut this member, say like using method of sections, if I were to cut this member here or here or here or here, no matter where I cut it, I would find that same axial force anywhere along that member. And you should think of this in contrast, you should consider this in contrast to say uh, what we looked at for beams. Uh, think, let's connect this back to shear and moment diagrams. When I have a beam, uh, when I have a beam, as we looked at on our previous discussions and on the first exam, um, when you have a beam, say with some sort of loading on it, you have a beam with some sort of loading on it, and you cut that beam at a certain location, well, what you will find is that there are varying forces in that beam uh, depending on where you cut it. So for example, shear would look, uh, what would this look like? You'd have something like, oh, you'd have to have something like this. You'd have to come down probably something like that, just doing that on the fly. Um, and then you'd have some sort of moment, so you'd have shear kind of like that. And you would have moment, oh, something, probably something like this. Actually, no, not like that. Let me think my slope relationships here. I'd have to, have, I'd have to come to a slope of zero right there. So something like that, and then it would start uh, decreasing. Uh, the slope would start going down again, and you'd end up eventually something kind of like that, probably. Anyway, uh, I'm not asking us to find the exact shear and moment diagram of this arbitrary uh, shape, but the point that I'm trying to get at is for this beam, uh, as I cut it at different locations, I will reveal different internal forces. Uh, namely, I will uh, reveal different shears and moments, depending on where I cut it. If I cut this beam here, I will reveal this shear force here. If I cut it here, I'll reveal this shear force here, which is, I suppose, zero in this case, and then a maximal moment. If I cut them, if I cut it here, then I have this moment here. If I cut it here, I have this moment here. 
uh, because there are uh, because of the end conditions and the types of loads on this element, this beam, um, what forces exist within the beam, the shear, the force, the, the shear, the moment, the axial force, uh, these vary along the beam. And what is special again about trusses is that because they have pinned ends at both, because they have they are supported by pins at both ends, and because they have no uh, loads applied uh, between the supports, between the ends of the element, uh, they will have a single um, a single axial force. So the shear and moment diagram for a truss element, uh, V and M for a truss member. simply be horizontal lines. They would be at zero. Because remember, we're saying that they carry uh, that they carry only axial force. So therefore a, a truss member or a truss element will have no axial will have only axial force and therefore uh, no shear or moment uh, within it anywhere along its section. So again I can cut a truss member anywhere along its length and it will have both zero shear and zero moment. And that's what's special about trusses. And the reason we study them in introductory structure analysis class or in introductory structural analysis classes is that they are a relatively simple uh, framework. And it's very useful to explore some basic uh, tools of structural analysis, which will then be expanded on in uh, later in the course and uh, further in later courses. Okay. Uh, questions so far, again, this is just kind of a review of the trust member condition, and then we're going to go on and look at uh, a bit more uh, trust theory, looking at the whole trust rather than the single element. Any questions so far? Okay. So that's just a bit of review and also a nice little connection to shear and moment diagrams. I know when you're first learning this stuff, these can seem very uh, disparate topics, like what's the relationship between shear and moment diagrams, uh, trusses, et cetera. And one connection is that these are all still talking about internal forces. And trusses are special because they basically have no shear moment within them. And if you were to draw the shear and moment diagram of a truss element, uh, you would find that it has zero shear moment within it and only a single axial force. Now, of course, this is, this is for an idealized truss. Uh, if you go out to, a, say, like a bridge that is a, a truss bridge, and you were to actually calculate the shear, the true shear moment diagram for one of those elements, uh, you know, in a big bridge or highway bridge or railroad bridge or something like that, you would find that it does, in fact, have axial for it does, in fact, have shear moment within it. But again, we're talking about when we're talking about trusses today, um, we're talking about idealized trusses. And like any like any kind of engineering model, it is a useful approximation to certain limits. But uh, when you actually get into design, there are other uh, subtle things that, you, that you'll need to look at. And in fact, uh, the uh, and in fact the uh, big group project that I'm going to have you do this term, which we'll be introducing probably immediately after fall break, uh, is. Uh, is going to involve uh, some trust member design and including looking at some of the uh, some of the more real world real world considerations beyond just the theoretical uh, trust model here. But anyway, before we can talk about deviations from the trust model, we need to actually introduce the trust model better. So let us discuss. So let us consider the trust member condition. Or sorry, not the trust member condition. Uh, just now that we have introduced the trust member condition, let us discuss uh, trust, trust behavior in terms of the entire frame. So now I'm sure almost everyone has probably seen a trust at some point in your life. In fact, I can almost guarantee it. Uh, any student, the, you know, I can think of numerous truss bridges around the Portland area. So I don't think uh, anyone has not seen a truss bridge at some point, uh, or a roof truss, or a floor truss, or or any of the numerous uh, types of trusses uh, we create. So let's think about a simple truss. And this would be a simply support. And this is, for example, a simply supported truss. 
And there are a couple of bits of terminology we should be aware of. So uh, we have a simply supported trust here and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and simply or supported referring to the entire trust um, where you have, uh, you know, pinned end and a roller end. And if I wanted to, I could, I should probably go and uh, now in terms of whether you actually draw the pin joints or not, uh, that's somewhat of a stylistic choice for this, for emphasis, I will, but uh, depending on context, you may not need to. But I, at least at this level, I want to be very clear that we're talking about a truss with pin joints all the way across. Okay, so a few ter a few bits of terminology to be aware of. We have um, all of the elements along the top row of the truss. We refer to these as the top cord. All of the elements along the bottom row of the truss we refer to as the bottom cord. And then the uh, interstitial elements, all of the vertical elements uh, here, for example, we refer to these as the truss web. And uh, hopefully, uh, and, and I'm not sure if you've seen this before, but um, hopefully you can sort of uh, start to draw some parallels between what we've talked about previously with beam design. And as you may recall, uh, if you think about something like a W section, or an I-shaped section, what you'll have there is you will have your flange, uh, your flange, and again, your web. So flange, flange, and web. And as you may recall from previous discussions, the flange is optimized for moment. The flange essentially carries your moment stresses or your flexural stresses or your bending stresses, depending how you want to phrase it. And your web carries your beam shear. And this is really no different in terms of trusses. The top cord will tend to carry your moment. And same thing with the bottom cord. And the web will tend to carry the shear of the truss. And this can be useful, especially for analyzing uh, non-statically determinate trusses. So a truss, there's several different ways of interpreting, you know, or conceptualizing a truss. And one way of conceptualizing or thinking about this is that a truss essentially is a, you can almost imagine a truss as, imagine you took a beam, you know, a beam with a flange, two flanges and a web. And imagine you simply cut out all of the, uh, all of the perhaps unnecessary material, or you cut out a lot of the material to save weight. So you initially had a solid web, and then imagine for a moment you cut out big windows in it. And then that in turn revealed essentially a truss. So imagine taking a beam and cutting out large sections of it. And at first you might think, then how could that possibly stand up? If, uh, you know, why would we have all that material there in the first place? Um, so again, imagine removing all of this material here from a beam. That would essentially reveal or turn that beam into a truss. And so again, you might think, why, I mean, how can that possibly work? Wouldn't that beam immediately fail? Well, as it turns out from just the properties of structural analysis, the properties of statics and mechanics, as you can see from real world trusses, uh, the answer is no. And, uh, now, of course, I don't recommend actually taking a, a plasma torch to a steel beam and trying to create a truss out of it. First, that is a horrendous waste of material. And on the other hand, um, this works when you've optimized the shape for it. You cannot just literally cut a truss shape out of a uh, W section and expect it to uh, carry substantial load. But anyway, there are a few, uh, some, uh, few advantages of trusses just in general, well, the primary advantage of a truss is going to be uh, weight. It is a, uh, a very efficient in terms of pounds per foot, in terms of pounds of structure per uh, low pound of load or something. It is, they are, they tend to be very efficient, especially at long spans. They are, they are a very efficient way of carrying substantial load over long distances. 
So uh, that's why you'll often see uh, if you go into a sports, uh, if you go into like a, a gym or you go into a sports arena or something like that, or uh, convention centers, other things like that, B big public buildings where you have, you know, you, you want to have very, very long, uh, clear spans between, uh, you know, you, uh, if you think of something like a football arena, you don't want, and this, then for uh, this would be, uh, you know, of course, American football, um, for a football arena, if you go to, you know, if you go to the stadium, you don't want to see, um, imagine playing a game of football where there's giant columns right at the 40 yard line or something. Imagine playing a game of football where there's just big columns right, literally right in the middle of the field. That doesn't work too well. So, uh, but if you go to almost any sports arena, you of course won't see columns right in the middle of the field because that would a little uh, cause uh, some interesting, well, I wonder how NFL or uh, other league rules actually work if you, uh, it, how, do, how, do they, how do they work if you have a column right in the middle of the field? Like what happens if the football hits a column? I don't know. Um, someone who's uh, more of a sports, sports nerd can answer that question, but um, I'm probably just not allowed to have uh, NFL games in an arena with those sort of things, uh, with big columns in the middle. But again, because you don't have, uh, so if you don't want columns in the middle of a long span, one way, and there are other ways, of course, but uh, one of the most efficient ways to do that is to build a roof system using trusses. So for the weight, they tend to be uh, pound for pound, they tend to be very efficient. And that really is their main advantage. Also, they can be, uh, they're relatively simple to construct. The connections are relatively simple. So your connections for your trusts are relatively simple. And what I mean by this is, uh, I'm gonna give an example of a steel truss. So uh, also this is structural analysis. We are beyond, a bit beyond statics. So I would like to, uh, I would like y'all to have some feel and some understanding for the difference between the theoretical model versus what these things look like in the real world. So let's look at uh, what does a truss, or more, particular, more particularly, what do the connections in a, say, a steel truss actually look like? Now, some of you I'm sure probably already know this, but uh, that's fine. So uh, let's think about what a what the uh, connections in a truss actually look like. So you might think for a moment, you know, when you hear uh, pin joints, you might imagine that we have members coming together and they're like almost like uh, like an old erector set, you know, or they're literally joined by mechanical pins. I mean, this is what the model kind of implies when I say pin joints. As if we have literal mechanical pins at the joint uh, between these two members uh, or between you know, any number of members, really. And while you could, and, and it, no, there's no reason you couldn't actually build a, uh, a truss like this. And that would be a very, that would probably be the best approximation of the truss member uh, or the truss behavior idealized trust behavior that you can actually produce in the real world. Um, but imagine making this connection. You're going to need to have, you know, a whole bunch of different sockets in the end of your members. The connections will be very complicated. That's not what we tend to do in real world uh, trust design and trust construction. Rather, what you'll have is something known as a gusset plate. And this again is for, this would be for uh, steel trusses. If you have, you, you also can have wood trusses and concrete trusses but I'll, give, I'll stick with steel trusses right now because those are relatively simple to explain. So what you'll have, a, a, a gusset plate is generally just a big plate of steel. So you might have something kind of like this, this malformed plate, and then you'll have elements framing into this. And then you'll just have a couple bolts on here. And this is horribly out of scale, but that's fine. So you'll have elements coming into the gusset plate, your truss elements coming into the gusset plate, and they'll be connected by a certain number of bolts. And uh, 
So again, and the elements themselves will be relatively simple. They usually, uh, you sometimes see W sections and trusses, but often they're just things like L shapes or just C shapes rather than I shapes. And um, those are a little bit, and those are a little bit easier to connect than you might have with a W section. But anyway, again, the connections are relatively simple. All you have, think about what you have to do to make this. You have your gusset plate pre-cut, you know, cut on a plasma cutter or something, um, or a water jet or something like that, maybe in the, uh, uh, maybe in the factory. And then you just uh, come along, you have your member here, you drill a couple holes, you bolt it on, and you're done. Relatively simple connections. Um, and, and again, think about how this works. Um, we are saying when we say, how does this approximate to the to this pin member condition? Um, again, with the pin member condition, we are assuming that we have um, no uh, moment transferred at the end. So, but think about this. Let's let's zoom on the. I want to zoom in on one of these connections. And this is very illustrative of the uh, of the principles of sort of structural approximation. And structural modeling, I should probably say. This is why I like talking about trusses, because they are a very good uh, sort of framework, for lack of a better word, of discussing some of the uh, more subtle elements of structural design. In particular, in particular, the principles or, or the ideas of uh, structural models, approximations, etc. A little bit easier with trusses to discuss some of these things. So, imagine you have an element, a truss element. And it, uh, at the end, it is connected to a gusset plate by just two single bolts, or even just three bolts or four bolts. I don't care how many bolts. Uh, think about, okay, so when we say a pinned member, what we are saying is, when we, when we talk about a pinned member end, we are saying that this member at its end cannot support any moment. So moment is zero. Now, is that true in this case? Um, in the truest sense, no. Uh, I, if I try to rotate this, imagine take, rotating, trying to rotate this thing downward where it's attached by these bolts, uh, I would be able to get a moment, I'd be able to get a force, uh, I'd be able to generate a couple, for example, like this, with this bolt and this bolt, and I would be able to generate a couple uh, through those two forces, I would then be able to generate some moment capacity. So truth be told, the moment capacity of this connection is not equal to zero. But as with all structural models and all engineering models in general, these are all just approximations. And so think about the moment capacity of this connection compared to the moment capacity of the member as a whole. So you're gonna have a member, you might have a C channel, for example, that has a web up here, a web up here, and you're just connecting it by a couple of bolts, I'm oh, sorry, a flange up here, a flange up here, and you just have a couple bolts uh, stuck in the middle of the web. So um, this thing is generated, this member, the C channel, from the side, it looks like this. The C channel is generating the vast, vast, vast majority of its moment capacity from the uh, flanges here. So it gets its moment capacity again because its flexural stress would be like this. So it's getting the vast majority of its moment capacity from the flanges. And in fact, right at the right at the center, the shear, the, the moment, the factor of stress is going to be theoretically uh, zero, right at the neutral axis. So um, this shape, is, this connection, is actually going to be incredibly inefficient at generating moment. This connection, because it's connected at the web rather than at the flanges. So the connection is going to be very inefficient at translating moment, which means that the uh, uh, basically the moment capacity, if you think about moment capacity, the moment capacity of the beam or the element is going to be much, much greater than that of the connection. So. Uh, and therefore, we can approximate this as a pin connection. So, yes, in truth, real-world trusses will have, uh, if you connect them with gusset plates, which is common, uh, 
yes, those connections will have some non-zero moment capacity, but because of how they're laid out and, um, and because of how they're connected, uh, their ability to transfer moment, uh, they can may, they might be able to only generate a, uh, like the moment capacity of the connection might only be a 10th or a 20th or a 50th of the member as a whole. In other words, if you, um, if you, what I mean by that is imagine you took the member without any uh, bolts, without a connection, and you just applied a moment to it and figured out what kind of moment would ne be necessary to say exceed the yield stress. Uh, that moment would probably would probably be 50 times or 20 times or 10 times greater than the moment required to, to do the same to these bolts in this connection. So again, um, because we connect this at, in a way, um, because of how they are connected, uh, we have uh, connections that are, our members have connections that have much, much uh, less moment capacity than the, the members themselves. And this is how we actually in the real world produce this pin member condition. Yes, if you really wanted to, you could literally create you know, mechanical pins joining members, but that's not a very efficient way to do it. Rather, we create connections that have much, 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 much less moment connections than the, than the members framing into them. And this is how uh, we create our pin connections in most conditions. So this is a great example, I think, of, uh, of uh, engineering models versus reality, where um, we model something as a, uh, you know, having zero moment capacity, um, but in but in reality, it does have some capacity. But uh, for design, that is often okay. Uh, again, everything when we do in engineering and really in physics in general, everything we do in engineering is based on approximations and models. Uh, the real world is complex. It has infinite variables. It has infinite uh, things that we might have to consider. Um, and if, but if you ever want to build anything in the real world, you have to make some uh, educated and intelligent approximations to distill down the complexity of the world into something that we can actually uh, work with mathematically. Otherwise, we would never get anything built. Okay, um, now that that uh, diatribe is over, uh, <laughs> any questions? You know, it's a good lecture when I can use the phrase, uh, you know, the world. I can really get my pontification on. Okay. So we've discussed that. And next I'd like to look at uh, trust determinacy and stability. And also talk about simple trusses, uh, et cetera, compound trusses, et cetera. So uh, first of all, let's look at static germinacy. Trust determinacy. In other words, how to determine whether a truss is statically determinate or not. And as a review, uh, as a reminder, determinacy of course means Uh, whether we can solve for all internal forces uh, for all internal forces using the laws of statics alone. Using the laws of statics alone. So, and uh, something, there are some uh, Benefits, there are some big benefits to using, uh, to being able to analyze a, truck, uh, a structure using only laws of statics, because uh, the nice thing about determinate structures when design, when designing is that you do not need to know anything about, um, do not need 
uh, section or material properties. So in other words, if I have a if I have a truss and I know that truss is statically determinant, um, I can find the forces in all of its members. With, and I uh, to do that, all I need to know is the loads on the structure on that truss. I just need to know the loads on that truss and the geometry of the truss. Like in other words, how long are the elements, where the joints are located, et cetera. So I, for a truss like this, which is statically determinate, I can find all forces uh, without, I don't need to know, for example, I don't need to know the modulus elasticity. I don't need to know the yield stress. I don't need to know the ultimate stress. I don't need to know the member. I don't need to know the member area, uh, moment of inertia, radius of gyration, et cetera. Um, if I just want to find the forces in each member, if it is a, if I can model that as an idealized truss, I don't need to know anything about either the materials or the member cross-sectional geometry in order to uh, solve for those internal forces. And, that, and in terms of design, the nice thing about that is that it allows you to avoid a lot of iteration that is otherwise necessary with other uh, non-determinate frameworks. Um, so there, that is the main advantage of determinacy in terms of structural design. Now, um, the downside of determinacy, so the upside is that, that and, all, and also the determinate structures do tend to be a little more efficient. Um, and I guess that's not necessarily always true, but at least with trusses, it tends to be true. Uh, now, the downside of determinacy is that uh, determinacy works fundamentally. Fundamentally, uh, and actually I'll just write this out because I think this is really important. It works fundamentally because there is one and only one possible load path. And only one, one and only one possible load path. In other words, imagine I were to apply an axial load here, or not an axial load, a vertical load here. Uh, I can apply uh, just basic uh, free body equilibrium and find the forces here and here, and here as well, I suppose. Um, I can find those forces and I can determine, you know, based on uh, if I know the magnitude of this and I know the slopes of, uh, if I know the slope of this line, I can find the forces in these other members. However, that also means, but and again, I am finding I can find that without knowing anything about what the, what the truss is made of, without knowing uh, anything about the cross-sectional properties of the members. What I don't know, I you know, I can find the forces in those members, and I don't care whether they're eye shapes or hollow uh, circular tubes or square tubes or C channels. I don't care, or and I don't care whether they're made of steel, wood, concrete, or styrofoam. If I have this geometry um, purely from the fame geometry, purely from the locations of the joints, if I know, uh, if I have a determinate truss, I can find the forces in all of the members using um, uh, just the laws of statics. But in turn, I am saying that 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 those members not only can carry those forces but they must carry those forces. They must carry those forces. And uh, what I mean by this in, in other structures, in, in non-deterministic structures, there are going to be many possible paths for load to travel. So if you have say a, a, a braced or a, a, a braced or a moment frame like this one, um, if I try to apply a load to it, um, you know, we can go and using um, some of the tools of structural analysis that we'll learn later in this term, uh, you can go and calculate the internal forces, shear, moment, axial force, et cetera, in every column and beam in this frame. 
However, um, there is more than one possible path for uh, the load to travel. And in fact, uh, our methods of determining the uh, forces within this framework, uh, within a framework like this, will actually depend greatly on um, things like cross-sectional area, uh, yield stress, um, well, maybe not yield stress, but in particular, uh, stiffness, uh, modulus elasticity, et cetera. And so, um, uh, but because of that, there is going to, there are, uh, because of its, because we need to consider those factors and that we're not just relying on the laws of statics, there are actually multiple pathways for load to travel. So if it turns out that, for example, imagine if this column here ends up being, connect this back to our discussions of structural risk that we looked at previously in the course. Um, imagine for a moment that this column ended up being not as strong um, or, as, or as stiff as we had planned, maybe due to construct some sort of construction error or defect, uh, maybe some damage after the building was built, whatever it might be. Imagine this column isn't as strong as uh, we are counting on. Well, because this is a um, because this is a non-deterministic structure, a non-statically determinate structure, um, if this column is not quite as strong as we are we were counting on, it can in turn shed some of its load to its some of its load to its neighboring members. It's like it's kind of like if you have you know a uh, I don't know, imagine uh, a whole bunch of people carrying some big heavy load. If one of them, you know, slips a bit and can't carry the load, they can pass the load off to someone else. Um, but with a, with a truss or with a determinate truss anyway, in, or any determinate structure, that is not possible. So in turn, with a determinate structure, you have zero redundancy. zero redundancy. So in other words, the trusts like this, maybe with the exception of this element, which well, that one's a zero force element, we can talk about that later, but um, with the exception, with, with the possible, well, actually with the, with the exception of this one element, um, because it's carrying no force, if I go and, uh, and that comes from its any condition right here, but I'm getting ahead of myself, um, but if I have this truss here and say it's simply supported or something, if I were to come along with a plasma cutter and cut out one of these numbers, I could cut out that one there. Imagine for a moment, instead of just like, you know, imagine it, imagine cutting the truss uh, at member at a certain location to reveal internal forces. Imagine I literally cut the truss at a certain location. I literally go out there with a plasma cutter and cut out I cut out a section there, or I cut out a section there, or I cut out a section there. Because there is no redundancy, if I cut this truss anywhere, the whole thing is coming down. This will be a catastrophic collapse. Um, well, at least for a simple, very simple system like this. Real world, built, don't be too worried about driving over bridges. They tend to have more, a little bit of redundancy built into them. So don't worry too much about that. But um, again, for a ideal, for a truly ideal deterministic structure, that uh, it it is only determinable by the laws of statics alone, because there is only one possible load path, and because there is only one possible load path, um, you are you are uh, decreed by the laws of statics that uh, these individual members, regardless of what they're made of, regardless of their sections, they have to carry these certain forces, and if they can't, if they're not strong enough, or something happens to them the entire structure will fail. So the benefits of statically determinate structures are that they are relatively simple to design and they also can be uh, highly efficient. Um, this idea of um, uh, having only one load path means that you can really optimize uh, your structures and say you can really optimize your structural elements because you know exactly what force every member is going to carry. And because of that, you can do a high degree of optimization, which results in relatively, you know, rather efficient structures. But in turn, while you do end up with a very efficient structure, if you design a truly determined structure, you end up with one with no redundancy. And if any element fails, the entire thing is coming down. Which is, uh, if it's not obvious, it's, uh, something we tend to avoid as structural engineers.
also, I would like to next look at how do we determine if a truss is determinate and in turn also uh, stable and also the types of stability. So questions or thoughts, comments so far? Okay. All right, so how do we determine if a truss is determinate? Oh, how do we determine if a truss is determinate? Very nice. Okay, so um, in fact, I'll just really roll with this and say determining determinacy. The bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. Anyway, uh, so determining determinacy. So uh, again, let's say you have a truss and these equations are uh, that I'm gonna be looking at are only for uh, truss, for idealized trusses. If you have any kind of other framework, you know, a braced frame, a moment frame, whatever you might have, uh, you'll need to use probably the, the uh, you can actually use the equations that we looked at previously where we had the, uh, oh, the number of three bodies, number of individual rigid bodies, number of releases within them, uh, et cetera. Anyway, so let's say you have a truss and um, let's say this had a certain amount of reactions and this would have three reactions here. So we'd have like maybe like an A, uh, an AY, an AX and a B, uh, maybe like a BY or something. So we need to define a few things. M, that's relatively easy. That's the number of members. Uh, let's say R is your number of reactions. And J is your number of joints. J is your number of joints. So each joint in this uh, truss, uh, now because we don't, we're not supporting members, we, because these are actually not because we're supporting, uh, not because we're not supporting moment, but because this is, each joint is really almost like a point particle. Uh, we can't really do a summation of moments about a joint. What we can do for each joint is a summation of forces in the X direction and a summation of forces about the Y direction. And if you were, if you were doing calculations with a space truss, a 3D truss, um, then you would have three equations of equilibrium for each joint. But uh, for a 2D truss, uh, and these equations that I'm gonna be looking at are for uh, 2D trusses. Um, for a two-dimensional truss like this, each joint gives us uh, two equations of equilibrium. So um, we get, for each joint, we get two equations of equilibrium. Uh, two equations of equilibrium. or equilibrium, as some might say. I don't know who would say that, but some might say that. Um, so uh, we have uh, two, so each joint is going to give us two equations of equilibrium. And uh, then we also have uh, a certain number of unknowns. Each M and R represents an unknown. So each M and R, each moment, or sorry, not moment, each member and reaction is going to represent an unknown. So in other words, uh, each reaction is gonna be, a, and by reaction, I mean like AX is a reaction, AY is a reaction, BY is a reaction. The individual uh, reactions are count as their own. So for this truss here, for example, R is three. Um, and if you had more, if you had say two pin joints, R might be uh, four. Uh, pit two pin supports, R might be four, for example. And so um, for, uh, so those are each, uh, you know, if we have certain loads applied to the structure, uh, each reaction, if we don't, we don't initially know those, those are unknowns that we need to solve for. And M, our number of members, 
And the reason, we, again, we can apply the number of members directly is that because these have, because we're dealing with uh, a truss, an idealized truss with perfect pin joints, uh, we know that this is composed entirely of truss members or entirely of members uh, with the pinned end condition. So each member will support one and only one internal force. So each M and R represent a single unknown. Again, each member has a single unknown force. So let's look at, uh, we have our equations and we have our unknowns. And so our equations, um, again, in terms of, let's think of this in terms of our number of joints, the number of equations that we have will be equal to two times the number of joints, so 2j. Meanwhile, the number of unknowns we have will be m, plus R. So, um, and just like with any system of equations and unknowns, there has to be a certain balance between the number of equations and the number of unknowns in order for us to be, uh, to solve the system. So, uh, in other words, if we have a, uh, let's say we have uh, 2J, actually I might write this on the other board just for, to, so I can give myself some a little more room. I want to be able to write this out nice and clear. All right, so now let's look at the relationship between uh, 2j and m plus r. Again, um, our twice our number of joints will represent our number of equations, and m and r, the sum of m and r, will represent our, uh, our unknowns. Okay, so let's say we have uh, the ideal case, at least for a deterministic truss. And that would be where m plus r is equal to 2j. When m plus r is equal to, equal to 2j, uh, your number of equations is exactly equal to your number of unknowns. So what that means is that you end up with one unique solution. And so you will in turn get a truss that is deterministic and stable. So kind of the ideal from the point of view of structural determinacy. So again, the sort of idealized case is that m plus r is equal to equal to 2j. Uh, at least from a statics point of view, you'll have a nice deterministic and stable truss. But then what if m plus r is less than 2j? If that is the case, you will have an unstable um, but deterministic uh, truss. Uh, unstable but deterministic. Or determinate truss. And the reason for that is that your number, again, your number of unknowns is going to be less than your number of equations. So we're going to have no problem solving for all of the internal forces. However, we're simply not going to have enough um, likely reactions to keep this thing, to keep, to keep this truss entirely stable. So you will be able to solve for all of the forces that are inside the truss, but those forces will not be sufficient to keep the truss stable either internally or externally. And then finally, the opposite case, m plus r is greater than 2j. Here, you're still going to have a nice stable truss. You have a stable truss. However, it's going to be non-deterministic. Or you could say statically indeterminate. And because, and the reason for this is that our, in this case, our number of unknowns exceeds our number of equations, and as such, uh, we are not going to be able to solve for all of the uh, for all of the uh, unknown forces. So, um, one, and then in terms of way, a way to think of this in terms of solutions, uh, let's see. This would have uh, no solution. Well, this would have uh, many um, possible solutions. So, this would have no unique solution. Uh, 
and this would have no solution. If you're thinking in terms of systems of equations. All right, that'll do it for today. Please let me know if you have any questions or comments. Again, in this video, we've explored uh, extending our trust member condition, our pinned me uh, member end condition, uh, to a entire framework. Uh, we've discussed the components of trusses in terms of webs and cords. Uh, we've looked at what uh, the uh, m modeled pins versus uh, real world pins look like in a truss. And we've uh, then went on to discuss determinacy, uh, some of the advantages of determinacy in a structure like a truss, and also some of the advantages and disadvantages of uh, trusses in general. And finally, we looked at how to determine whether a given truss uh, is statically determinant and stable or unstable. All right, that'll do it for now. Please let me know if you have any questions or comments. Uh, always like to answer any questions that I can. Uh, regardless, please like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon. And as always, thank you.